Hello, mm. hello. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Super, mm. super lovely to see you all. Mm. Um, so I am here with Julia Billings, um, otherwise known as Woolen Flower. <laughs> Hi, Jules. Your studio oh. looks absolutely beautiful. Oh, thank you. I'm very lucky. I, look, I waited for a long time for a studio. I was working at home for five years, but finally found somewhere that's, that's lovely. So it's great to be able to welcome people here in person, but also virtually. Yeah, it's a nice Definitely. corner. <laughs> absolutely fabulous. Right, so it looks like lots of people are joining, which is brilliant. Welcome, everyone. Um, so please do feel free to use the chat to let us know kind of where you're tuning in from. Say hi. And also, if you have any questions for Jules, um, feel free to pop those in the chat. Um, Jules is going to be doing some demoing and stuff today. So if there's anything you'd like her to elaborate a bit more on or any questions you kind of have as we go, please do pop those in the chat and then um, I can fire them away at her at opportune moments. Okay. Um, and then we will also have more of an official kind of Q&A session right at the end of the, um, of the demo as well. Um, my name is Sonia. I am the co-director of John Albin Textiles. It is our open weekend. Um, welcome. Lovely to see you all. Um, thank you for joining us. And then this is a really exciting session we've got today because we have Jules, um, as I mentioned earlier, and you are going to be talking to us about some natural dyeing and particularly seasonal natural dyeing for us in the Northern Hemisphere. So um, talking us through the process and then also kind of helping us go out and learn some confidence and see what we might forage from our local hedgerows at the moment. So yeah. that sounds like a real treat. Yeah, it's all about trying to facilitate more plant dyes in the world, you know? <laughs> go out there and do it. It's, you know, it's, it's a simple process in, in its essence, but I think there's just a few things that people need to kind of understand about fibre preparation and then the process of making the dye bath. Um, and then once you kind of understand that, the kind of the world's your oyster in the sense of being able to just try. There's so many different dye species out in, in our landscapes, no matter where we live. Um, and, yeah, hopefully, hopefully uh, you know, you feel equipped after today to, to try, you know, to have yeah. that. Yourself. wonderful do let us know in the chat as well like so many of you have said hi which is brilliant but do let us know if you've had a go at natural dyeing before or mm. any sort of dyeing for that matter um I've tried dyeing with kool-aid but that is about as uh, <laughs> as brave as I have gotten so far so I will definitely be taking some notes today mm. and then um next weekend I might go and do a bit of foraging nice so I've never tried Kool-Aid. Was it easy? It was very easy. Yeah, you just sort of sprinkle some like sugary, artificially mm -hmm. coloured powder on things and then put it in the microwave. Uh, <laughs> it mm -hmm. was very simple, but it was great fun. I did. I it. think that's, the, that's a great way to, to start. You know, I think that's what's so kind of fantastic about different techniques is there's lots of different, you know, you can go from woe to go, you know, in, over, a, over a whole long kind of period of time and a lifetime of learning. There's you never stop learning and um, gateway kind of gateway um, techniques are really, you know, they're so important. Otherwise, you know, um, if, if we're intimidated by the plant process, the plant dying process, we probably wouldn't start, you know, so. Yeah, definitely. Well, I think we've got so many people. We've got actually quite a lot of people in the chat who've been saying that they have had a bit of a go with natural yeah. dyeing. So that's wonderful. It looks like we've got a combination of some people who've used acid dyes or other dyes and then quite a lot of people who've used onion skins, beetroots, oak bark. Um, avocado so quite a lot of different methods mm. which is brilliant so um, what I shall do without further ado you have got some demoing to show us mm -hmm. so I will take my face away because we don't need to be looking at that 
And instead, I shall <laughs> get up your beautiful demo rowing circle. Yeah, and are these all um, minis that you have natural dyed then? Yeah, so I, I thought I'd just show you this as a kind of introduction. So a tiny wee bit about myself. My name's Julia. Jules is, is just fine. Um, and I'm based in Glasgow in Scotland. As you can probably tell, I'm not um, Scottish. I'm from Australia, but my husband and I moved here uh, about seven years ago. And um, yeah, love Glasgow, really interesting city, a uh, great place to get out into the highlands from. Uh, and we have a camper van, so we go out um, hiking and, and foraging as, kind of as a side activity um, as often as we can, so it's beautiful. So my, my background is horticulture. Um, I trained uh, about 15 years ago and through that time and kind of afterwards I worked in various different aspects of horticulture. So uh, landscape management, so in a private garden setting, but also I worked for a company that did a lot of large scale indigenous landscape kind of revegetation. So a lot of uh, roadside plantings on big freeways, wetlands revegetation, um, schools, all kinds of things. And we grew all of the indigenous plants to to kind of revegetate those areas. So that was a, a really dynamic company. Um, and I also worked in children's environmental education. So looking at, you know, sustainable kind of energy, worm recycling, um, habitats and understanding how kind of we and other creatures on the world fit together. And um, yeah, so quite a diverse um, background in horticulture. And um, and at the same time, I was working in knitting. So I was teaching knitting and working in a yarn shop part-time and doing quite a lot of, of knitting like all of us or most of us. Some of us might be crochet people or weavers or embroiderers. A lot of spinners as well. I yeah, think of course, spinners. spinners in the chat. Totally. Mm -hmm. So fibre folk. Um, and when we moved, when we decided to move to Scotland, I planned to continue working in horticulture, but um, it was midwinter and uh, there weren't really many opportunities. And I was got lucky enough to have a very small stand at Edinburgh Yarn Festival selling some naturally dyed yarns um, and some pouches that I was making at the time out of um, recycled or re upcycled Harris tweed. Um, I'd learnt to dye with different plants at my local hand weavers and spinners guild, which is where I learnt to spin before I even started to knit. Such a great resource, the spinners guilds. Um, and I used to join once a month on a Thursday. I'd take off work um, and uh, there was a woman there, Robin, who ran the group and she would basically ask for $2 um, uh, donation and she would make a dye bath out of either exotic kind of dyes, things like madder or cochineal or indigo, so old ancient dyes, or local indigenous flora or weeds, lots of different types of things. And we would all take our kind of prepared skeins along and we'd all put them in the pot together and learn how to work with that dye. So it was a huge kind of revelation for me and a real rabbit hole that I fell down. Um, <laughs> And um, so I, over the kind of next five years before we moved here, I just spent, you know, his time on the weekends making up um, dye bars, filling my back veranda with um, jars of solar dyed, you know, where you put all the, all the plant material in and stuff your wool in and, and see after a month what comes up. So I was doing a lot of exploring and experimenting. And, um, and so when we moved here, um, I guess that side of my life kind of took off a little bit. I think people were interested in natural dyes and um, not that many, not as many people, I, I, I suppose, as I thought there might be kind of doing it on a slightly bigger scale. So over the last seven years since we moved here, I've just been doing more and more plant dyeing and learning more. As I said, dyeing is a lifetime's work and I, I think particularly natural dyeing, you can spend, you know, 10 years just perfecting using one plant and dye masters from around the world do you know often do only work with one or two different plants or one or two different techniques so I'm a little bit greedier than that because I'm a horticulturist I'm always interested in learning about all the different plants so I'm not very good at, at being dedicated to a small number but for me that's the joy and I hope this class or this workshop or demonstration will uh, open you up to the things that are growing around you um, and maybe how you might like to combine them with some of the more traditional dyes. Um, so this was a, a colour wheel that I dyed at a weekend-long workshop at Cat Golden's farm, a garter stitch farm, um, a couple of months ago. And I think it's a really good demonstration of 
um, a rainbow that you can make um, with natural dyes. Of course, you can make a much bigger one with a lot more different shades in there, but the limitation of the workshop meant that we dyed 20 colours. Um, and this is a really lovely demonstration of the fact that in order, well, by using local dyes, things that you forage yourself, you can make kind of a good maybe 60% of this colour wheel, but there are colours here that you'll struggle a bit more to find um, sources for uh, around your local neighbourhood or in your country, in your country wherever you live. So there are um, lots of local yellows and greens, kind of these type of sagey olivey greens in our local hedgerows or fields or communities um, around the streets where we live. Um, Does that apply in North America as well, or yeah, is that New Zealand and Australia? Is that absolutely. sort of the same wherever you're? you're yeah, it is. Here? Interestingly, interestingly, I think the uh, yellows and kind of russety shades, these types of ones here, um, and greys and browns, those types of shades are really common around the world. But mm -hmm. things like blues and purples and pinks are things that are, um, you can definitely grow your own. Say, for example, you can grow woad in the UK or you can grow indigo in lots of different parts of the world. Um, but particularly pinks and things are actually the most um, difficult thing to grow yourselves. And really we have, the main source we have are insect dyes. So things like cochineal or kermes or lac, which tend to be um, either in Latin America or Asia um, and uh it's pretty difficult to grow those yourselves. It's a whole other kind of aspect of animal husbandry. It's, it's totally different to growing plants. But you can make your own blues um, and reds from, um, from matter, but the pinker ends and the purpley ones are, are um, pretty difficult to find yourself. So what I would like to focus on are, is this kind of aspect of the rainbow today. We will talk a little bit about these types of shades, these kind of tealy um, aquamarine shades, because they are achieved with local yellows with indigo. Um, and so you can make half of this colour by using your local forage things, but then you'll need to work with indigo or woad over the top. Um, to make your these types of shades of green. Interestingly, green is one of the most difficult colours to achieve with natural dyes. There are a couple of dyes. Um, well, there's one in, in South America, um, a particular kind of a lichen, and then there's a, um, um, a kind of a rush which grows in, in many parts of the world which can give you this type or a little bit clearer green. But actually, green is really, really um, elusive in the natural world. So really to achieve a, a strong, long-lasting green, you need to use a, a local green or, a, a, sorry, a local yellow or, you know, another more traditional source of yellow plus indigo. So we're going to be focusing on here. Um, and I wanted to show you quickly um, a little slideshow just of some of the shades that I thought would be interesting to see. Um, it's a little bit of my own work just to show you some of the ways I put together colours just for a couple of minutes. Um, and it just gives you a bit of a sense of a slightly expanded view of, of natural dyes. So this is just a photo of the Botanic Gardens in Glasgow. They have a small area which is dedicated to uh, fragrant plants used traditionally in perfumery, um, medicinal plants as well, um, plants for fibre, things like nettle and flax, and they also have a small dye bed. And um, I looked after it for a couple of years. And it's, it's, it's just always interesting to see the, the types of plants that are growing in these gardens. Most botanic gardens will have some form of bed or area where you'll see dye plants. So do, do go and hunt that out if you can. Um, and that's just another view of it. So that is just a photo of my studio. That's just some of the, the shades that, um, that I make. Uh, darker shades behind, so it's a bit of a limited palette just to show. But, um, yeah, these ones here are interesting because I think I tend to use about 50% locally foraged material and 50% uh, what I would call exotic dyes. So matter for, for kind of the, the, this russety um, orange red um, and the salmon next to it. Um, I use cochineal, which is an insect from I buy from um, either from Peru or from uh, the Canary Islands for pinks, um, and then I use blue. But everything else really is local, um, locally foraged. So 
on the just to the right of the screen, we have um, some golden some yarn that's dyed with golden rod at the top. And I'll show you some photos of these dye plants a little bit later. Um, and at the bottom, it's dyed with rhubarb, so rhubarb root. So those are things that are very readily available to me in Glasgow and that I forage for myself. I, I find them fresh and then I basically use what I would call an immersion technique. So I'll chop them up into really tiny pieces, usually put them in a bag of some kind and then pour hot water over them, let them steep or perhaps simmer them and then um, pull the material out and I'm ready to put my fibres in. I'm going to show you that process um, in about 10 minutes, but just to, just to show that these are local dyes. And the ones on the right, the, the much greener green, is um, goldenrod um, and buckthorn, which is another local species over dyed with indigo. So you would not be able to achieve that colour with anything other than a yellow and a blue together. So your, your, natural, your local forage dyes have a really important place in making a full rainbow. And just the little colour on the left, uh, left hand side on the bottom is a nettle, uh, it, mohair dyed with nettle. And nettle is a real, another really fantastic source of, um, of local dyes. So, as I said, I use um, a combination of, ooh, hold on. Is, there we are, a combination of about 50% exotic and 50% locally foraged. So it's another, just another view of some of the shades that I achieve. Again, at the back is matter root, exo exotic imported. And at the front is um, bramble leaf on the right, um, a lichen in the middle, and then goldenrod and rhubarb to the very far left. So we'll talk through these plants later, but I just wanted to show you. Ah, oh, I seem to be having a bit of problem just. Um, Scrolling through, there we are. Again, on the le bottom left is a locally foraged colour and bottom right and top right are local yellows over dyed with indigo. Um, same again, matter on the left and local yellows over dyed in indigo. So you can see it's a very different palette to sometimes what people think about with natural dyes, that you get a lot of yellows and browns and pale, pale shades. You can achieve a huge range if you use, I think, a combination of those two sources of dyes, exotic and, um, and local. That's just a palette I put together for Rachel, my lovely friend Rachel, daughter of a shepherd. Again, a combination of exotic and local dyes. Um, just a series of samples. Here we have logwood dyed yarn on the bottom, which is a purple. And then at the top, we have a rhubarb yellow. So just to expand your range again, Unexpectedly bright for local dyes. The yellow is birch leaf um, and the blue is indigo and the pink is cochineal. Um, it's my friend Anna Maltz's design here, again showing very much a rainbow, a strong, strong shades, combinations of matters and local yellows and blues. Uh, another one of her designs using nettle to make that soft greeny gray in the middle, avocado to make the little um, uh, peachy pink triangles and tansy for the yellow and tansy with indigo for the green. Uh, this is Maddie Harvey from Scotland, Glaswegian designer, uh, Edinburgh designer, and that's cochineal for the pink and then birch leaf for that kind of soft chartreuse green. Uh, this is a lovely booster beanie, one of the Shetland Wool Week uh, designs, a natural brown with madder forming the more ter terracotta yellow, uh, terracotta shade, and then avocado for that softer pink. Uh, and this is a friend of mine, Amanda Ho, her design um, uh, Glimmer of Light Shawl um, for one of the making magazines, and that's nettle for that soft, um, soft silvery sage colour, and then um, dock leaf for the yellow. So a weed in most people's book. Here we have a natural shade for the body and then buckthorn, um, plus indigo for the leaves. So um, indigo here plus avocado, but you could also use a pale matter bath for that edging colour. So, yeah, lots of opportunity for different shades. And here the, this last one is my own design, and that's uh, using matter for the red and logwood for purple, neither of which are local dyes. But then for the brown we have sumac, which I'll show you in a little while. For the grey we've got oak. And for the pink, we have cochineal. So half and half again. So here is our beautiful matter, our exotic dye. 
and here are what we look at mostly with, with our local dyes. Um, so this is just from a workshop um, and shows you the huge range of, of shades that you can get from local dyes and I think a really beautiful palette. Uh, so I'm now just going to quickly show you the samples that I've dyed for today and then I'm going to basically show you the technique that I've, I've used to achieve those samples. Um, and we're going to, you know, I want, I want you to understand the technique, but we're not going to spend a really long time on that. But uh, I just want you to understand so you can get started. So this very first one uh, we dyed with is Marigold. Um, and I'll show you that one in a second, but I'm sure most of you probably know Marigold from your garden or um, you see it often in, in floristry shops. Um, beautiful source of yellow from the petals. Uh, Feverfew. It's a, um, a weed or it's a plant that we see growing in kind of disturbed grounds or through the cracks on roadsides, um, and that will give another clearer yellow. You'll see the, in a moment. Then we have a birch, uh, lots of species of birch around the world, um, and I used downy birch for mine, um, which I'll show you in a moment, and I used the bark, which I'll talk about. And then our black walnut, which is a very traditional dye. Um, has been used around the world um, and we, we use these little holes, so the outer casing of the nut. So I'll show you those, um, those dyes or those dyed samples now. So, Sonia, can I get you to do from yeah. aerial view? There we go. Perfect. Great. So these ones, um, these are beautiful John Arpin yarns and these were dyed with marigold petals. And I made a total mistake. I, I completely forgot to keep um, a clean marigold, like a, an un, um, uh, unprocessed marigold to, to show you. But it's basically the Tagetes species. Um, there are lots of Tagetes species around the world um, and they all give colour, different versions of yellow. This one's blowing out a little bit on, on the... Um, on the screen, but it's a really vibrant, rich kind of gold, a little bit of brown in it, but also a bit of green. So it's an interesting, um, interesting uh, series of colours. On the right here, we've got an alpaca, uh, two alpaca yarns. So the alpaca supreme lace, I think, and then the fingering weight. And you can see that they are a little bit cooler and a little bit greener than the wool to the, to the left of them. So different fibres will pick up dyes in different ways and display the colours in different ways. So it's always really um, interesting to put samples of different types of bases into your dye pod and see how they pick up the yarn differently. Uh, so, yeah, alpaca, 100% alpaca, I think, or has it got other things in it? Maybe it has some merino in there as well. What, the Supreme? Yeah. The Supreme is 40% al alpaca, 40% uh, merino and 20% silk. So ah, beautiful. So that's what real shiny as well. Incredible shine. Yeah. So interestingly, I dye a base in alpaca and I find that it doesn't pick up as much color, nearly as much as the wool. So I was quite surprised that even though it's a slightly different color, it's still quite rich. And I think that's probably the merino or the, and the silk as and the well. Silk. silk really yeah. picks stuff up, doesn't yeah. it? And then these ones, this one here is apple door lace. Uh, which has picked up a little bit more than the Devonia DK. So this one is a little bit darker to the, to the kind of eye. Then we have a superwash merino and you can see, oh, actually, is it? No, it's the Exmoor Sock, which is, tell me what blend that is, Simon. Uh, so that is um, Exmoor Blueface yep. and Corridale mm -hmm. and then... 10% swart balls, so it's got that slight grey undertone to it, and 10% yes. nylon as well. Yes, so. That's right. So both the superwash, because it is a superwash yarn, isn't it? Yes, yeah. it is. Both the superwash process um, and the grey means that it's quite a lot darker. The grey obviously will darken, and we can see that with the Zwarbles yarn here, which is, you know, over um, over a light and then medium um, mix of those wools with other, other wool. Um, and I think they always make a really interesting kind of heathered yarn. Mm. But the superwash yarn, superwash process also enables um, yarn to pick up 
a lot more colour. And that's because the scales that, that coat wool fibres, which are removed in the soup wash process or certainly um, stripped back, they are what protect the fibre and stop um, anything to, from penetrating. And when we dye, we actually want the dye to penetrate in. And so um, because those scales are not intact, it means that the superwash yarn can pick up a lot more colour. My understanding is it doesn't always hold on to colour as long as non-superwash yarns. Okay. Um, that, I don't know if that's always the case, but that's my experience. But those two things mean that you can pick up a lot more colour by using an, a superwash base if you, if you choose to go down that route. Yeah. Um, so it's just always an interesting thing to, to pop different fibres in. It's really interesting to see the darker colours, the ones yeah. on the sport balls, they almost look green. Absolutely. In yeah. that way that when you add black to yellow, oh, you yeah. get green. But, yeah. um, Thank you for pointing that out. It's absolutely true. So, you know, I said earlier that it's quite difficult to achieve greens in natural dyes. Well, that's a great way of avoiding that problem. They'll always be a slightly... Um, they won't be that kind of clear turquoisey green or bright grass green. Um, they will have a, that hint of kind of black because that's how we've achieved them. But I think it's a really lovely way of um, if you pop in just white fibres and then something like these, you'll get a palette, an ombre effect just by doing, just by having them in the same dye bath together. Beautiful. So that was our marigold. It's just the petals. Um, and I used about, well, I'll talk about percentage weight of fibres in a moment, which basically means how much, um, how much dye material to fibre. But I used about twice or 200% weight of fibres, so twice as much marigold as I did fibres, okay? Um, and I just shred the petals as much as I can. Uh, pour boiling water over them and allowed them to sit overnight in the boiling water. And then in the morning, the dye bath was beautifully rich, orangey kind of colour. So I took the marigolds out and popped my fibres in and raised them up to temperature. And, and I'll talk you through that process in a moment. But that's really what I've done here, okay? You can use fresh or you can use dried. Uh, you may like to collect your marigold from the garden and pop, um, as they flower, pop them into a container in the freezer um, and once you have enough, you can take them out, defrost them, and then make a dye bath. So it's a really easy thing to collect. Someone's just said, do I mordant? Yes, I'm going to talk about mordanting in, in a second, but thank you for pointing out. I have prepared the fibres to make them receptive to dye by mordanting. Don't worry if you don't know what that is yet. We're going to talk about it in just a second. <laughs> um, this one here was dyed with fever few. I saw in the chat that somebody said, did I say that we can dye with daisies? Well, feverfew is part of the daisy family and there are many members in the daisy family that will give you dyes. Uh, feverfew is, um, is a common medicinal plant. Uh, it's also something we see popping up a lot in, in um, wastelands and disturbed grounds and in people grow it in their gardens. It's a little white daisy with a, red, a yellow centre and a very strong fragrance. Um, uh, but feverfew is a, is a lovely one. It's not considered a, it's not commonly thought of as a dye plant, but you can see we've got a really lovely, clear, kind of cool yellow, which is quite different to the marigold. Mm. With this one, I used about four times as much, um, four times the weight of fresh material as I did to my fibres. So this is about 40 grams here in my bundle, and I used 160 to 200 grams of, um, of fresh uh, feverfew. Is it and the middle of the flower that you use then or is it? It's the actually the whole, what I would call the aerial part, so everything above the ground. So you can use the okay. stem, the flowers, the petals, the leaves, all of it. So, okay. Yeah. Whereas the marigold is just the, just the petals. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, again, we've got our alpaca here, slightly cooler, slightly greener. Then we've got our two wools, non-superwash wool, superwash, the lights wobbles and then the mediums wobbles. So you can see that they've dyed quite differently. Um, the next one I wanted to show you is, uh, let me just pop it here, is birch bark. Birch bark is quite a traditional dye um, and it's it, on a fully grown, like on a, if you, um, if somebody was to remove a birch bark from a tree or if a tree was cut down, um, we don't use the outer bark, the papery bit. We actually use the bit on the inside of the papery bit, um, so the proper, the true bark. 
Um, and this was actually from some very small um, branchlets that I used when I was harvesting um, for to use the birch leaf in another workshop. So you can use birch leaf. I think I showed some photos of birch leaf for a very clear yellow. But you can actually also cut up the, the twigs um, and pour hot water over them and simmer them for an hour and achieve a soft pinky, um, pinky tan colour. It's so absolutely it, beautiful. It's lovely, isn't it? Yeah. It's really nice and quite unexpected, I think. People don't always think about bark as a dye source. Um, but it's lovely to see from one particular tree you can get a number of different colours. And I've also got a... Uh, a jar of the catkins um, soaking at the moment that have a similar colour in the water itself. So this gives a soft pinky tan colour, looks different on each of the bases, and I particularly love it on some of the, the dark, the swarbles. It just, it's not coming up fantastically on camera, but it's got this beautiful kind of hint of pink mm -hmm. that makes it almost like an aubergine colour. So that's a really, really lovely dye source as well. So I used about 100%, so um, equal parts um, uh, bark to fibres I wanted to dye. Um, and just as I said, poured hot water over and let them soak overnight, simmered them for an hour, um, and, and there we go. So it's really, really lovely source of material. And the last one I dyed, wow. The last one is actually on the pot at the moment. We're going to see that in a little while. But this, the last bundle I have to show you is walnut hull. In the photo I showed you of the black walnut, it was a little round casing inside of which you find the hard shell and then the nut on the inside. And walnut is a very traditional dye source. Um, this is black walnut from the States, but you can also use um, walnuts from other parts of the world. Um, and basically what you do is collect those hulls as, the, as they drop from the tree. You, you open it up, or if it isn't open already, you can open it or take remove the, the shell with the, with the nut on the inside. And then um, what I tend to do is as I collect them over a period of weeks, um, I fill a bucket with cold water and I just add the hulls in as I collect them. And then once that bucket's full, by the time I add the last ones in, the water will have turned kind of a caramelly brown um, and it's ready to die with. It's actually fine if it ferments and goes a bit manky and, and stinky. That's a, that's a totally fine part of, of dying with uh, black walnut hulls. Um, you just, you'll find the studio wherever you're working, maybe work outside, otherwise you'll find the room is a little bit stinky. Um, with this one, this was 100% again, so same um, amount of dye material to fibre that I would dye with. Um, and... These were just soaked, as I said, over a period of time, and then I heated them up to simmer them for an, for an hour or two, left them overnight, and the next day I put my fibres in. So really, really simple process, um, but a beautiful source of brown. Sometimes browns are unpopular in, in the world. I don't know why, because I absolutely love brown. I think it's one of the most beautiful, diverse, dynamic colour. Um, but even if you don't love this colour on its own, Walnut over dyed with other shades is really, really fantastic. So, for example, this one here, this yarn here is not John Arpin. Well, this one is. This is Devonia. Um, but this is cochineal on its own. It's quite a strong pink. And although I love it, I find that it's, um, it's quite pink for me. This is cochineal with over, over walnut. And you can see it just fades that colour out and makes it a little bit more dusty. So the, the walnut can really be a lovely base to kind of tone down other shades. Um, and I think any of our browns or our greys or, you know, soft yellows in natural dyes should never be ignored because they're always a great base for other colours. Um, I just have one other one I wanted to show you. Um, over dyed with walnut, or over dyed with indigo. So this here is just straight indigo on its own. So it's a very clear blue, really nice on its own. Uh, this one here is indigo over walnut. And you can see the walnut just takes it into a bit more of a petrol kind of blue rather than just a clear blue. And I think um, I, I personally probably prefer that one just for wearing as a garment. Um, neither of them are better than the other. It's just um, showing you the capacity to modify your colours and to get complex shades by using two layers of natural dyes. And for me, that's often where you get the most interesting colours. You know, these ones here are quite um, complex and these ones here are a little bit clearer. So walnut is great for that. 
Okay. When you are layering two natural dyes, does yes. it matter which one you'd put on first or? No, and I'm not experienced enough yet to, to know exactly how that's going to happen. There's lots of variables. It's how strong each dye bath is, um, which one you lay down first, how long the yarn is or the fibre is in the dye bath. Um, mm -hmm. I think you develop a knowledge of that as you go. Um, okay. I don't, I don't have that yet. I mean, I, you know, with some dyes I do, but I don't think it's as simple as do this one first and then do that one. It's, mm. um, yeah, it's, a, it's quite a, sometimes the chemistry of natural dyes isn't what you expect. It's not like yellow plus red equals orange. Sometimes you get these quite unusual colours. Like, for example, this one here, this is um, rhubarb leaf, which, uh, sorry, rhubarb root, which is like a mustardy, ochre shade over a pink and you get more like a caramel for me, from a colour theory perspective, it's not what I expected, you know, but actually it's really lovely but, but quite complex. Yeah. Yeah. So those are, the, those are the shades I've dyed already and I just wanted to show you easy things that I, I had around my neighbourhood. I have one last bath which is on the stove at the moment and we're going to look at that in a minute. But before we do that, I want to talk through mordanting process. So somebody said before, did I morden? Basically, most dyes... Um, will not bond to fibre if you don't prepare them with the use of what we call a mordant. And it means that um, if we put an unmordanted fibre into a dye bath, um, we might get a little bit of colour transfer, but we won't get a deep colour. Or we might get a good strong colour, but the colour won't be long lasting. So it might fade. It won't have what we call fa good fastness. So fastness is how long the colour will last. Or it might change colour. It might go from kind of a clear yellow to more like a... Um, a soft straw colour. So things will change. It's not a stable colour. So the use of mordanting is very, very traditional. It's ancient. We've been using mordants, you know, since we've been dying really. Um, and the most commonly used one and the one that I use um, with pretty much every dye I use is what I would call alum. So that's aluminium potassium sulfate. Um, and it's a very, very traditional dye. It's also used in pickling and in brining. Um, it's still on the, F, on the US FDA approved um, list for ingestion, although I, I, never, I never do, would never take it internally. But it's just showing you that in terms of um, adding something in to vastly improve the colours that we get and the longevity of your colour, it's a fairly innocuous material. Um, it's the kind of thing you can pour on your turf in your garden to get rid of it. You don't want to put it straight into the water system, only because we want to minimise what we're putting in the water these days. But um, you can put it on plants with no problem. You can also reuse your modern bath multiple times to get the most out of the bath as possible. Um, but aluminium potassium sulphate is my go-to mordant for pretty much everything. I don't mordant things like indigo dyed fibres, um, some walnut, depending on the shade you want, doesn't need mordant. Um, rhubarb root doesn't need it, but most dyes I would use. So I would always pre-mordant uh, my fibres with alum. So the analogy that I like to give with mordants is um, it's a bit like wallpapering. If you have a wall and then you have wallpaper, if you just try and stick that wallpaper onto your wall, nothing will happen. You need the glue. So we put the glue first onto the wall and that forms a bond and then we put the wallpaper on to the glue and, and the wallpaper and the glue make a connection. And alum and mordanting is very much the same process. So we apply the alum to our fibre in a bath. Um, I'll answer that question about protein fibres in just a second. Thank you for that. Uh, we, we apply the mordant in our... Uh, we apply the alum in our mordant bath and it bonds to our fibres. We give them a rinse and then we can put them into a dye bath and the dye then bonds to the alum. So it forms like a chemical bridge between the two materials. Oh, dear. I think we're having a little bit of te technical, uh, technical difficulties here. Hello, I'm just swapping to my phone. I think the computer is just a bit of a disaster today. No, that's fair enough. So... We were talking about um, making the dye bath. Did that all come across? Basically, we, um, we pour hot water on our dye material, whatever it is. Um, we, ch we chop up our dye material as small as we can just to increase the surface area as much as we can, um, just to allow extraction of the dye material. 
Um, I usually tend to contain my dye material in some kind of bag only so that I don't have to fish it all out by hand. But if you're only working in a small scale, that's not really important. You know, if it's just a little handful, you can just fish it out with a sieve and that's fine. Um, but I do find the bags are helpful, are really helpful for... Um, Would it get stuck to the yarn, though, the dye yeah, material? Yeah, so. exactly. So that's the reason why we don't want to leave it in the bath when you dye. Hmm. Generally speaking, um, I make the dye bath by simmering the material in the pot and then I take the, the bag or the dye material out and then I put the fibres in to avoid it all getting tangled in. Okay. Um, there are a couple of dyes, things like matter root for that kind of rust, rusty red, that it continues to release more colour as it's heated and as some of the colour is taken out of the bath by the fibres. So it can you can get stronger colours by leaving the matter in the bath. Mm -hmm. But I suppose the, the downside to that is that um, the... Any part of the fibre that touches your bag full of dye will be darker than the other areas. So you can get a bit more patchy dyeing. So it's generally for me, I prefer to take it out. But it's good to know for, you, for yourselves in your own work that you can leave it in. Uh, just watch the patchiness and just contain it in some way. Somebody's just said, do the bags need to be cotton or could I use... Something else? I can only read the first line of the chat. Uh, do the bags need to be cotton or could I use reusable fruit and veg bags sold in supermarkets? Absolutely. You can, someone, thank you, Vampy. you can totally use those. Um, you can use any material you want, really. Mm. I had a lot of questions about whether I wanted to use um, polyester bags, which most of the mesh bags are, only because we're so aware of plastics and um, releasing things by heating plastic um in water like that um but, but i do find that with the cotton bags because you're heating it the cotton actually starts to break down quite quickly so the longevity on those bags is not nearly as good um and that's such a great example of how there's no real ideal solution to anything we just have to work out what's viable and most feasible and also feels best with how we work in terms of our environmental ethics or financial capacities, all of those things. But mesh bags, cotton bags, um, a colander, you know, you could just put this at the top of your pot and just immerse the dye material into the liquid this way and take that out. Yeah. Um, old cotton, you know, pillowcases or sheets that are kind of at the end of their lives, you can make bags out of those and just accept that over time they're going to break down, you know. Um, whatever you find, or leave it loose, but just get a really, get some gloves and just have to know you're just going to have to fish it out a little bit. Yeah. Um, so I hope that answers that question. Yeah, no. Yeah. So. There yeah. is someone who um, has said that they use um, retired net curtains. So yeah. that would probably be absolutely perfect. Absolutely. <laughs> Go Definitely. to a charity shop and pick up some net curtains. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then Morwenna also just wanted to double check um, whether it was okay to use a big jam making pot or not, because she says she's got a big heavy duty aluminum yeah. pot. Yeah, up. it's absolutely fine. I guess what I was trying to explain is that um, most, most metals other than stainless steel will um, release tiny, tiny particles, they will start to pit over time and some of, the, some of the metals from that pan will start to be released into the dye bath. Mm. With, particularly with an aluminium pot, that's absolutely fine because, because you're using aluminium as a mordant, all you're going to be doing is adding a tiny little bit more aluminium in there. Mm. Um, I guess my main kind of hesitation, firstly, I work on a larger scales, so the little pots, don't, those pots don't work for me anymore. But over time, I just find that the surface starts to pit and degrade and some of the colour actually gets absorbed into the pot. So you'll shorten the life of the pot by doing that. Mm. But if you have a pot that's free to, you know, to be used in that way and accept that over time it might start to degrade, yeah. a jam pot's the best place to start for sure. Yeah. If you've got one, go for it. Yeah, and so you just would want to make sure, presumably, that you're not using a pot that you then intend to cook with later. Definitely, like yeah, a special always, for sure. pot that is just for dyeing. Yeah. Totally separate material. To yeah, definitely separate gear um, and separate a whole separate kit for dyeing with natural dyes. Unless you're only using things like food waste and you're not using any 
mordants or anything like that, you could, you know, you might be able to prepare, say, say if you're dying with, you know, avocado pips or onion skins and you're not going to die in that pot and you're not going to use um, any mordant in there, then you could potentially prepare the dye bath in there. But I would just suggest getting a separate pot anyway. Yeah. Of yeah. Course. So I'm just going to pivot you around. I make sure I don't show you the mess in the studio. Now, I, now it's like it is, and just so tidy and like <laughs> wonderfully creative. Isn't it? Like, I wouldn't worry. Yeah, now, now you get to you see another see side. The corners of our mill, Jules. Totally. <laughs> so now I want to show you the 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 yarn in the pot. So just to clarify, we've made our dye bath. Uh, we brought it up to about eighty to eighty five degrees. Um, with the water, we left it overnight and then we pulled out the brambles. Now, this morning, I put actually a couple of hours ago, I put um, my last bundle of, um, of mini skeins into my pot. And that's what they're coming out from the nettles bath looking like. It's just blowing out. Oh. Um, it's a little bit more chartreuse, yellowy green. Then you can see. Can you see? Can you see that, Sonia? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Great. So this is quite similar in a way to the shades that we dyed with um, Feverfew. Not that dissimilar. Mm. The Feverfew is a little bit brighter and a bit, I think, a bit more interesting a colour. But nettles on its own, uh, sorry, bramble on its own will give you a yellow. But what I want to do is actually um, use iron to shift this colour. And that's because iron can be used before we can be used in place of alum as a mordant. So before we put the fibres into the bath, we can actually prepare our fibres with iron. We use a different concentration than what we did with alum. We use a lot less. We use about 2% weight of fibres um, uh, compared to 10% with alum. But we can certainly do that or we can put now put these into an iron modifying bath. So I tend to use the word mordanting for before but before dye bath process and modifying is after a fibre has been into the dye bath. Um, and we do this really to shift the colour. So remember a few moments ago, I hope you heard, um, that I was saying that tannins, um, have a very strong affinity with iron. So yellows, if we apply iron to um, yarn that's been dyed with a tannin-rich plant, if it's come out yellow in the dye bath, that yellow should go to an olive green or a khaki or maybe a grey or a very deep kind of sludgy green. Um, and that's what I wanted to show you today, just to show you how you can actually extend the range of your colour palette just by using iron as a, as a modifier. Some people choose not to use any of these substances. They might use um, uh, plant-based mordants and no kind of mineral mordants or modifiers. Um, that's a whole other question that we don't really have time for, but I think it's, again, it's, there are plant-based mordants from Southeast Asia. So for me, importing leaves from Southeast Asia doesn't really feel like it should be more sustainable to use a plant-based material rather than a, than a mind or a, um, alum that's been synthesised. But it's never as simple as that. You know, the air miles that are, you know, going to growing, to going into transporting it and, and also the energy and resources that go into growing those plants, um, you know, there's a, there's a cost there as well. So explore that yourself. If you do some research, you'll find plant-based mordants um, and similarly some people don't use um, iron um, as a modifier because they choose not to use minerals and that's fine um, again for me I because I can get a huge range of colors from a relatively innocuous material like iron something that we ingest that we use in our gardens and that gives such a huge color change I do use it um, but you know you'll make your own decisions um, based on what you feel is ethically kind of um, so somebody's just said, what iron compound do you use? I use um, ferrous sulfate. So it's just like what we buy in the garden centre. It's just like what we have in our, um, in our iron supplements um, and it's pretty easy to get hold of. Somebody also asked, do I use rhubarb leaf as a, as can I, can I use it as a mordant? There, yes, it has oxalic acid in it and oxalic acid is a mordant. Um, 
there's a couple of issues I've found with rhubarb leaf as a mordant. The first one is it gives you a yellow. So alum is clear. It's totally neutral. It doesn't add a colour before we start dyeing. So you have to anticipate that if you use a rhubarb leaf mordant, you're going to lay down a colour already. And that tends to be quite a sad yellow. And I find it dulls down the shades that I over dye on top of it. So that's an issue. Um, the other issue is that I don't find it's as colour fast. It leads to as colour fast colours as alum does. So again, colour fastness isn't everything. You know, if you're making a shawl for your wedding and you want to use beautiful flowers and fruit like blueberries or brambles or elderberries to make these incredible um, purples and shades of pink, um, those colours won't last, but maybe what you might like to do is every year at the time you get married, you know, you might like to over-dye that shawl and add the colours and rejuvenate it. But mm -hmm. fastness for somebody like me where people are using my yarn to make colour work jumpers or um, mosaic stitch things or embroidery, I have to be really clear about colour fastness. So I find that the rhubarb wooden isn't as colour fast. I hope that answers the questions. Yeah, Definitely, it's all about application. You know, definitely. And yeah. then we've also had um, Morwenna has asked, um, could you also use just rusty nails? Um, yes, vinegar as well. Yes. So could you use some iron that was just sort of around hanging the around? That's yes. already in the world. Absolutely. Yeah. That the challenge with that is that you don't know how much you're using, and out and iron can damage protein fibres quite dramatically. Ah, so so traditionally, right. traditionally the in, in your rugs and tapestries, the colours that will degrade most quickly and the fibres that will degrade um, are the ones that have been modified or mordanted with iron. It actually makes the fibres more brittle and, okay. and they break down quite quickly. So just got to watch out how much we use, which is why we only use that 2% weight of fibres instead of yeah. the 10 that, alum, that we do with alum. Okay. So that low kind of level means that you have control over how what you're applying to your photos your protein so don't, don't throw in the whole random bucket no. of nails that you have no. sitting around <laughs> oh. no and that's less of a problem with cellulose or plant-based fibers but with protein you've just got to be careful yeah. um and again application if that's okay you know mm -hmm. see how you go so i'm going to add some iron into my pot Okay, I'm going to add 2% weight of fibres. My fibres weighed 40 grams and my scale only goes down to one. So it's going to be about 2.5 grams of iron will be going in there because I can't, it would be slightly less than, than one if I was really, really sticking to my two grams. You can use up to 4% and some people do use more than that, but I was taught not to and a lot of the books will say the same. So... Again, it's about understanding, you know, like tradition and the stories. There are lots of stories in natural dyes that we hear and we accept, um, and it's good to challenge those and understand are they, are they correct or is it just, you know, something that one person found but that not everybody finds applies to them. Mm -hmm. And I think um, challenging iron, you know, the, the, how much you can use and for how long is really an important important thing to do so you could you could either add alum uh, sorry iron into the bath or you can add uh, iron into a fresh pot of hot water and modify and and modify that way if i wanted to use this bath for something else i would do it the second way so that i could put more fibers in here um, and uh, continue to die i couldn't do that with iron in there because my fibers would be in um, in the iron bath for too long Mm. We don't want to leave our iron um, our fibers in the iron bath for very long, so we're just going to do ours for about um, about five minutes. Well, actually, as little time as you need, really. Did you have? Is there a question, Sonia? Um, I was just saying that's really not a long time then. Five. No, it's not long at all, actually. Um, and I just um, it's something to be aware of. As soon as the color changes, or you get a color that you're happy with, then mm -hmm. take them out. So the less time they're in the bath, the better. Okay. I just wanted to show you, this is, I've just added some of the, the bramble bath into my little tub with the iron and you can see it's changed it from a yellow bath to a very dark black bath. So can you see that's yeah. just the reaction that's happening between okay. the tannins in the bath and the iron. Okay, amazing. 
So I'll pop that back in the bar. Remembering we just, all I've done is weigh out 2% of weight of fibres of iron um, and then popped it into the bar. And now we'll add our fibres in and hopefully we'll get to see in situ. So I can't do an aerial view of this, but what I'll do is I'll pop them in here and then I'll basically continue to the move them constantly um, and I'm going to keep bringing them out to show you. So can you see already the colours gone from a yellow um, to more of a kind of mm, like a, it's a little bit sludgy at the moment. Yeah. But definitely a green, like it takes it from yellow to green instantly. So can oh, you see? Wow, yeah. yeah. How much that's really changed? changed. Oh, it's a beautiful colour. It's like a sort of sagey green shade. Yeah. I love yellow and iron and particularly nettle and bramble make a really beautiful version of everything from kind of silvery sage to kind of quite dark grey. Mm. So the, the length of time you leave it in there will, will define how dark that, that, so, that sage kind of goes. So you can see it just continues to darken. Beautiful. And just leave it in for, until you get the colour you want. And as soon as you get the colour you want, what you want to have is a pot next to you with warm water about the temperature of about the same as, as the bath you're taking the fibres out just so you don't shock and felt your fibres. And just a clean hot water. And the reason for the clean hot water is that that stops the colour from progressing further. So it kind of halts the iron um, from changing, continuing to modify the colour. So is that, does that kind of... Does that process seem pretty clear? So basically 2%, 2 to 4% weight of fibres. I always start with, um, with 2 just to see how it goes. Um, and I can always add more in. And let me just get, so sorry, I thought I had everything organised. But I'll just get a little bucket just to show you. Um, how the colour is looking. Normally I wouldn't um, use just my bare hands for this. Just because iron, long exposure to iron, breathing it in, that kind of stuff, it's not great for you. It's just, I, you know, gloves makes it all fine. It's not that it's toxic, but it is quite strong. Mm. So we just want to be mindful of that. You can wear a mask if you're particularly sensitive, but normally I would have gloves on, but, you know, okay. workshop setting. Of I just course, do the best thing. Of course. We've also had another question come yes. through, which is if you were dyeing fibre, um, yes. would the approach be the same? Would you just braid the fibre and then drop it into the bath? Yes, but I probably would put it in what I know, either some kind of mesh bag or yeah. what in Australia we have something called gutter guard, which is basically to prevent leaves from getting in your gutters on your roof. And it's like rigid mesh. And you can basically, when I learned to spin, I used to wash my fibres in the gutter guard so it stops the bag from kind of slushing about and it keeps the fibres contained and flat. So I used to lay it flat, lay one piece flat and then another one over the top and then just either use cable ties or elastic bands just to hold them, kind of sandwiching the fibre in between. Yeah, just to really discourage it from yeah, moving. From moving. Someone has just commented to say apparently one can get that here as well. Right, yeah. <laughs> so... So that's our colour. That's just a really short um, dip into iron. So you can see, well, I'll show you. If we remember, it was similar to this and now the colour's dramatically different. So it was only in for a short period of time at the lower end of the percentage range. Um, so you can definitely get much stronger colours um, using the iron. But it really does give you a huge range more, you know, a, a greater range of colours. Let me just wash my hands and then I'll come back. Of course. Thank you. Okay, so now that we've talked about the technical aspects of dyeing, I thought we could run through some of the um, local plants that you might have around where, where you are. Uh, there's certainly things that grow in Scotland, in North America, in kind of some of the more temperate parts of the world, but there'll be things in, um, in the same families or kind of groups of plants that you can access in wherever you live really. So the first group of plants I wanted to talk about are our yellows. And the reason I want to talk about them is because that's the majority of the plants that we find growing around us, no matter where we are in the world. Uh, there are lots of different shades of yellow, yellow kind of golden, uh, rich yellows like the one on the right here, um, into kind of softer straw colors and into our greens. 
Um, and don't be discouraged if you do find that you end up with lots of different yellows because they'll all be different and um, they work particularly well being over-dyed with things like indigo or woad to make many, many shades of green. So, um, yeah, always useful. So let's, let's have a chat through them. So this is yellow on, on fabric and that's actually dandelion, very soft dandelion bar, so making beautiful soft golden yellow. And dandelions are found at huge parts of the world, just the flower tops, so the, the petals and the stem, um, just made in a bath the way we've done before and just in early spring when they're young and fresh. So this is feverfew, the plant that um, I used to dye that kind of acid yellow in our samples. Just you can use the entire part, what we call the aerial part, so everything above the ground, so stem, leaf and flower uh, for a lovely, uh, quite a bright yellow. And marigold, which we also spoke about, which gave us our golden rich samples. Um, again, just the petals. You can use the leaves either in the same bath or separate, but they will add a green element to, to the bath. So it'll take it from a kind of rich golden into more like a chartreuse kind of color. Um, but a beautiful plant found in lots of parts of the world. Then we have tansy. So tansy is uh, part of the daisy family, uh, which holds lots of different dye plants. And just either the flowers again for a really rich, warm, golden yellow or entire parts, so aerial parts, um, again, a little bit more green. So we often find that if we add the leaves in for our yellow plants, we end up with a slightly greeny yellow. Uh, and lovely summertime harvesting one, that one. Uh, tansy and ragwort are commonly um, confused. So ragwort is a plant that we actually find native to the UK and native to lots of parts of temperate um, countries. Ragwort's actually indigenous, but it is a weed because it's quite toxic to livestock. So um, we find that most, most farmers will be very happy if you go and collect ragwort um, in, your, in, in paddocks and... Um, uh, any area where livestock are growing. Again, a really lovely rich yellow. You have to be careful though, use this plant outside because it does have a like a latex or milk um, that can be a little bit irritating for some people. So make the dye bath and use it outside. Um, aerial parts again. Then we have willow. So there are a lot of different species of willow around the world. Um, we have many in the UK here. And you can either use the leaves alone for a rich golden ochre color or you can use the leaves and the stems. And the stems, like any woody material, have tannin in them. So that will um, take it into a slightly browner family. If you use the leaves separately, you can actually make a dye bath out of the bark to get soft pinky shades, like we did with one of our samples with birch bark. Uh, so it's a really versatile plant, um, harvested in summertime, and you can save the bark for winter um, and also the leaves. I find with leaves, generally speaking, you get a fresher, brighter colour if you use them fresh, um, but a lot of them will dry well, which is great for uh, our wintertime dyeing when there isn't much growing. Then we have heather. So heathers um, are a fantastic source of dye. Uh, again, very commonly found around the world. I know there are different heather species in Australia where I'm from um, to what we have in the UK. Uh, we can use it, most commonly we use it at um, the time of flowering. So we can harvest just the tips uh, with the leaves and the flowers. Um, if we use just the soft uh, kind of less woody material, we get beautiful, rich gold. If we use the woody, woodier parts, so with the bark, that's obviously going to introduce tannin into the bark, so it's going to end up a little bit more on the ochre side or mustard rather than gold. Um, but a beautiful, very readily available source for me and in lots of parts of the world. Then we have gorse. So gorse is, um, again, very common. We just use the flowers. Um, it's very prickly plant, so it's not the most comfortable to harvest, um, but the flowers give you a lovely rich colour. Not particularly long lasting, and I should say that a lot of the yellows are not always as long lasting as some of our, our other dyes. Um, but again, it's all about application. So if you don't need the dye to be really long lasting, gorse would be fine. Whereas if you're making a tapestry or something like that, um, I'd avoid gorse and look really carefully into which of your yellows are colour fast. And a good book will tell you that. That's just gorse when it's going into seed, just in case you weren't familiar with the flower and how it looks as it changes um, over its life cycle. 
Uh, this one here, I didn't have a big photo of bog myrtle, but this is my husband harvesting bog myrtle in Scotland. Uh, bog myrtle is a plant, part of the myrtaceae family, so same family as uh, eucalypts and lots of other kind of very aromatic plants. And aromatic plants like this, which have volatile oils, particularly in the leaves, we're not talking about aromatic flowers, but more the leaves, they are often dye plants. And you can see on Scott's hands, the resin from the bog myrtle is, is orange yellow. So you get a really lovely, rich, um, ochery yellow from bog myrtle. Uh, very readily available where it grows. It doesn't grow in a lot of places. It grows in wet areas of Scotland and the UK, uh, Scandinavia. But where you find it, you usually find a huge amount. So bog myrtle is a great one. Uh, that's it in winter time. If you ever see that shrub, when it's dropped its leaves, you'll know it's bog myrtle. Another source of yellow that's commonly available to most of us uh, is pomegranate. So pomegranate skin is the part that we use for a soft um, kind of, uh, it's not a bright golden yellow, but it's a soft golden yellow. And it's a lovely colour in combination with other things as well. Um, pomegranate also has a lot of tannin in the skin. So uh, if you use an iron modifier with it, you'll go, it'll go from gold to dark grey, kind of cement grey colour, really, really lovely. So we scoop out, use the flesh for our, for our eating or juice making, then we scoop out the kind of the segments in between the seeds. We just pop that in our compost and it's just the outer skin that we use. Uh, this one here is Mahonia. It's not a particularly easy photo to see, but I wanted to show you the holly-like nature of the leaves and the berries there. Uh, Mahonia is a great source of ochre mustard colours, particularly in wintertime. Um, it's, the colour is found on the inside of the bark and... Um, you can remove canes. It's often thinned out in wintertime when there's not much else growing. Um, it's a great source of, of that shade, so a really useful dye plant. And this one here is Barbary, so a, a, um, a cousin to Mahonia, another very common garden plant um, with that little holly-like leaf as well. Um, the photo is a little bit misleading. The Barberries um, are actually used for, for eating generally, um, depending on the species, but it's, again, it's the bark that we want, the inner bark. But you might be more likely to recognise it um, from a photo with the berries. This one here is cow parsley or Queen Anne's lace. This is a beautiful source of a cooler shade of, of yellow, and we're going a bit more into the cooler, greener shades here. Whole aerial plants in springtime when it's flowering like this um, will give you lovely shades of kind of celery, particularly with iron. Uh, here we have hawthorn or may. Uh, we can use all parts of the plant here except for the berries. I'm just, uh, I think kind of a bit of a surprise. So the uh, leaves will give you a rich yellowy um, green. The bark will give you, similar to our birch bark, pinky tan shades. And the flowers, although they're white, if you simmer them for long enough, you'll find you get a quite a strong acid yellow from the flowers. It would take a really long time to harvest that, but it's an interesting science experiment to see that even in, even in a white flower, you can still get colour. Uh, that's in flower. There. So that's when you want to be harvesting those flowers. Here we have ivy. So the, uh, the leaf of the ivy will give you a soft, um, soft greenish gold colour, um, but it's also a useful one in wintertime when we have berries like here. So berries, the berries themselves with iron will give you rich um, ochre shades and green shades um, uh, with, with iron as an overdye, as a modifier. Here we have St John's wort, uh, which if you use the whole aerial parts, you'll get a soft greeny gold. There's an interesting experiment in the Jenny Dean wild colour book that I showed you where you can get four different shades from the flowers. So I'd encourage you to have a look at that one. Uh, goldenrod, which gave us that very rich gold um, at the beginning of the slideshow with the four, um, four colours. The one on the right was the goldenrod. Depending on the time of year and the source, I find it can give you everything from rich golds to more greeny golds, but a fantastic garden source um, and something that grows wild in many parts of the world as well, different species of goldenrod. Here we have colt's foot, which is one of our first flowers to, to uh, flower in spring. Um, the flowers look a little bit like dandelion, um, but it's characteristic in that it's, as I said, it's the first flower, one of the first flowers to, 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 to appear. And it, the flowers appear before the leaves, which is very unusual in the plant world. Um, I just use the leaves for a very soft kind of shade of primrose. 
uh, that's it when it's gone into um, into seed, just to show you how different it looks from a dandelion there. Here we have fennel, so we can use the fronds of the fennel plant from garden fennel or bronze fennel, lots of different species. Again, just a soft greeny gold. Uh, we have knapweed, which is a common uh, plant here, similar kind of shade, greeny gold, all aerial parts. And buddleia. So buddleia is a very common garden plant. It's actually a weed here. It grows through buildings and um, on top of buildings all around the cities in, in the UK. Not a very colour, fast colour, but a really beautiful one when it does um, when it does give um, when we when we do use it. So it's again chartreuse gold from just from the flowers, and it doesn't matter what colour the flowers are; they all give the same colour. Meadow sweet aerial parts again, lovely acid yellow, quite a green shade, but quite strong. Uh, we have ladies mantle, same again, aerial parts, similar shades. And fireweed or epilobium, rose bay, willow herb, you might know it through a few different names. Aerial parts again for a green, greeny gold. And daffodil, daffodil flowers, lovely thing at springtime to use to, to give you those same shades. Verbascum or malane, same again, really common garden plant. Uh, we'd be using the leaves rather than necessarily just the flower heads, but you could try both together or make them two, two separate bars just with the flowers and one with them together and see, see the different shades you get. Uh, pineapple weed, um, very common little weed, uh, growing indigenous weed here, um, more yellows. And elder, I don't use elder flower, elderberry, I think we spoke about that um, through the demo, but the leaves and also the inner bark will give you nice shades in winter time. And here's just a spring, little photo of spring showing we have dock at the front, uh, we have um, ground elder, we have mint, we have nettles, all of those spring greens will give you uh, nice greeny, greeny yellow shades. Uh, broom, similar again, and yarrow. So yarrow gives tends to give us a greener yellow again. Whole aerial parts, it grows as a wild plant in the UK and many parts of the world. And we have our rowan as well, rowan or mountain ash. Yellow from the leaves. Um, unfortunately, no colour from the berries other than just kind of a buff colour, but it can help to brighten up a matter bath because it's quite an acidic um, material for fruit. Uh, here we have an orange, which is from our Dyer's Coreopsis. You can see the flowers at the back. Um, just another daisy family member and gives you really lovely, rich, uh, rich oranges. Um, really nice dye plant to grow yourself. Here we have dahlias. Again, we use the flower head for this one, another daisy family member. And regardless of the colour that you, colour flower that you use, you get the similar, similar shades to the Coreopsis, nice, rich orange. Uh, you can actually wait until the flowers are a little bit spent when they go a little bit mushy and use them then. You could put a little pot in the freezer and just collect them slowly and add them in. And then when you have enough for a dye bath, you can go ahead and make that. Here we have elderberries. Um, like just to show you some of the pinks you can achieve and the different shades depending on the pH of your bath, but not colour fast. A really nice experiment for kids and for learning with your own experimenting with pH. Um, on the left here, we have the pink that you can achieve from avocado pips. And I have used avocado pips quite a lot in the past. I tend to not use it anymore only because some samples I have of it have held up colour-wise color really well. The fastest has been really great, but others not so much. So it's not reliable enough for me. But you can definitely achieve lovely soft pinks from that. So then we start talking about more of our browns and greys, so our tannin-rich plants. Here we have um, on the bottom left, we have Devonia, John Arvin Devonia, dyed with um, oak orbs. It gives us this lovely soft uh, shade of tan. And then we have a lichen to dye the kid mohair there. So our tannins, as we spoke about earlier, are really important sources of um, dye material. They give us uh, a shade, various different shades of brown and yellow and pink sometimes. But then with the addition of iron at the end, we get greys and rich browns and purpley kind of shades. So I just wanted to talk through a couple of them really briefly. This first one is birch bark, which we spoke about earlier, um, for pinks with, with the bark. Then we have alder cones. So we can use the cones, the bark and the leaves for different shades of kind of mustardy uh, caramel toffee here you can see. Really, really lovely dye plant found in wet spaces, wet, wet areas. Here we have our walnut, which we also spoke about. That's the green walnut, but you can use different species of walnut. 
Um, and it's the outer hull of that you can see there that we use, but you can also use the bark and the leaf for browns. Here we have horse chestnut, which is um, the, I found just through experimenting, I found that the, the casing of the, 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 the chestnut also has lots of tannins in it as well. And the bark is also harvested and used um, ground to make a powder for tannins. We have horsetail. Now horsetail and nettles, all of these different ones, and comfrey and beech mast are all different sources of soft greys as tannins. So a little bit pale and, and insignificant just as a straight dye bath, but as soon as you use iron at the end, you get very soft shades of greys, silvery sage, kind of rich, dark uh, khaki, those kinds of colours. So really lovely sources. Uh, here we have staghorn sumac. Um, I'm harvesting some there as it's as the leaves are, um, are ready to go in autumn. Staghorn sumac is a beautiful source of a rich grey with iron, uh, like a warm grey really, like a mouse mouse grey, grey brown. So you can use the little um, pyramidal fruit, the um, with the little berries, or you can use the leaves. Um, a really lovely one. And the other great source of iron, which I don't, uh, sorry, tannin, which I don't use in immersion dyeing to make a dye bath, but which can work really well for eco printing is rose leaves. So they have a lovely shape that comes up well if you eco print and then modify them with iron. And the last group I wanted to talk to you about was uh, lichens. So there are many, many different species of lichens which grow in any wet area of the world. Uh, Scotland is known for certain species of, um, of lichens that have been used for making um, Harris tweed and different kilts and all different kinds of um, aspects of the textile tradition here. Uh, many of those species were over harvested. So um, they're very slow growing, generally speaking, and we don't harvest, harvest them from when they grow in situ these days. But there are a few species that you can collect um, after storms, whenever there's wind, you'll find that there are three species that I, I kind of see growing around a lot. The first one here is, uh, well, this is a tree with lots of different species on it, but the little feathery, uh, green feathery plant um, here that you can see again in this photo is Old Man's Beard. And Old Man's Beard is a lovely source of just a soft yellow, um, nothing, nothing really significant, but the fantastic thing about lichens is that they don't require alum for mordanting to make a fast colour. So if you, for example, you want to dye a yellow and then over dye it with indigo, you don't need to use a mordant so it reduces that one step out. And this is particularly useful for things like mohairs or silks, which are quite delicate fibres and the more processes we put them through, the more likely they are to kind of felt or be damaged. So old man's beard with indigo is a really lovely combination that I use quite a bit. So just you can see here, that's just me harvesting after a storm. There's stacks and stacks that comes down on branches and you just pop, pop the little bit off the tree and you can use it fresh or dried. Here we have oak moss, which is another what I would call a windfall dye or a windfall lichen. So um, something that we find a lot of after storms. This one gives us lovely soft shades of orangey russet. So um, also the added bonus with this one is that oak moss is used in perfumery. It gives a beautiful base note. So your wool or whatever you dye will forever smell like the forest floor when you, when you dye with it. So similar, use it fresh or dried um, and, yeah, plenty of it around. Uh, and just this is the last little photo to finish. Um, this is our woad in seed, just going into flower, from flower to seed. And don't forget that you can grow woad as a source of indigo, um, of, of blue, to over dye or to work with as a base for over dyeing with other colours. So I hope those have been helpful. Um, and, yeah, get out and do some dyeing yourself. There are sure there are plenty of plants out growing where you, where you live. Uh, and always get in touch if you have any questions. I'm very happy to answer anything. Thank you so much, Jules. That was absolutely fascinating. I of know course. we had so much kind of positive feedback in the chat as well. So I think people okay. really loved it. And we've got a couple questions coming through here as Please. well. Yeah. Um, so what would you um, what would you recommend for a first attempt? Well. Man, depends where you live. There are so many things around, but even things like um, what you get from your local florist. Like if somebody gives you a bunch of daisies, oxide daisies or 
tansy or dahlia flowers. Um, what else do you get? Roses you can also use, not, not in an immersion dyeing, but you can use the, the roses for eco printing. So that's a whole other technique. If you eat research eco printing, you can use the leaves for those. Um, you can use, oh, what else? So many of the trees around us, particularly in temperate climates, but also in the tropics, so many of our leaves will give us colour. So, for example, oak leaves and galls and acorns and bark will give you fantastic sources of tannin. Um, so yellowy browns but greys with iron. Um, we can use alder um, cones and leaves. We can use elder flowers, oh, sorry, not flowers, elder leaves. Um, you can use the elderberries but they're not colour fast. Um, you can use birch, as we've spoken about today. Um, so lots and lots of trees. Willows also are great. You can get great oakery um, mustards from the leaves and pink from the bark. Um, onion skins and avocado pips, not great colour fastness, but very accessible. Okay. Um, I also found a bag of old herbal tea in my, in my cupboard, which has got calendula, uh, nettle and raspberry, and all of those are okay. local dyes. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cook that one up and try and so see what colour Maybe I just a bit of herb tea, whatever you <laughs> have <laughs> close to hand. Absolutely. Well, I mean, hibiscus flowers, which are one of the kind of ones you see a lot on Instagram, that, that's what gives you the colour in your, like, raspberry teas and things like those fruit teas. So plenty of colours in those. Um, what else? Nettles, comfrey. Uh, so many different plants. Budlia, if you're well, that's, in, that's blooming at the moment, isn't it? You've got stacks some of that. So good, stacks and stacks of that. Not great color fastness, but it makes an amazing, uh, like peridot kind of greeny yellow on silk, particularly, and so beautiful. Um, so again, you know, on a garment, you can always redye. But it's just more with knitting yarn and spinning and stuff. We have to be a bit careful just because if we're combining with other colours, it's a bit more difficult to over dye, mm. you know, in, in like a fair isle or whatever. Um, somebody has said, just said goldenrod, tansy. Uh, there's another one, willow herb, which is just coming into flower now in Scotland. Mm. That's fireweed, I think, in North America is the same species. Um, somebody said pea family. We have, uh, I've never used. Um, vetch um but indigo is part lots of the indigos are from the um pea family so it's worth trying you know sometimes members of families that have a lot of other dye plants it's worth trying just to see does this one also have dye color in it yeah mm. and then we've got um someone asking if you've got any favorite book recommendations ah excellent yes you're asking the right questions. So I have a few excellent books. There's lots and lots of books out there, but I picked three to show. The first one is Jenny Dean Wild Colour. So she's, a, I think, Devon-based or Dorset. I'm never quite sure, but somewhere in the south of England. Really beautiful dye book. It's got everything you need to get started, and I still use this as a reference. So plenty of Plenty of joy for this one. Really, really, that's my number one book. It's a book I found after about a year of dying and wished I'd found it when I started. Um, if you're um, Sussex, thank you, Sarah. That's great. If you're based in Scotland or if you're based any, if you're any, if you really want to get into local dye parts of Europe, um, or I imagine a lot of these would also be applicable for North America. Um, maybe not indigenous to a North America, but they'll be weeds. They're weeds in Australia. They're weeds in lots of part, parts of the world that were, were colonised. Um, the, the Colour Cauldron by Sue Grierson. Um, this is a really brilliant book for lots of your local dyes that aren't talked about in um, kind of more classical books. So they're things that might not have the most amazing colour fastness, but that you will have all around you. And I think there's a huge value in that, um, just understanding the, the application for things. And if, if part of natural dyeing for you is about getting into the like, landscape and finding joy, then I, I'm a really big advocate for lots of, you know, trying what you have rather than being limited to a small range of plants. And the third book I would recommend 
for a really good balance of technique and tradition and modern application is Dyes from Nature, which is a Finnish book. It was put out by three Finnish academics, young, youngish women, um, and it's got a really lovely, um, yeah, it's a really interesting combination of, of traditional stuff, but then also, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to find, they have a really great section on the back about discharge printing and how you can use natural dyes in, in much more, in a much wider range of um, applications. So that's a really lovely one. Uh, I can see lots of other recommendations. Any, re any ways to cut down use of power? Um, turn your pot up to start with. Get yourself a nice thick pot so that it holds the heat. Turn it up to start with to the, or get it up to the temperature you need and then turn it off completely. You don't need to continue to apply lots of heat if, um, if you have a good strong pot. That's probably the best thing. And could you use a slow cooker? Definitely, as long as it gets up to temperature. There is a trade-off between um, time and temperature. So if you can't get it up to the 85 degrees, you can just dye it for longer period of time. Um, you might not have quite the same fastness or you might not get quite the same colour, but you can really explore that beautifully with a slow cooker. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then there was someone uh, way back in the chat who was asking if you need to then <clears throat> bathe it in vinegar to colour fast it or no, is it no. just colour fast because you've done the mordanting beforehand? Yeah. yeah. The, people often talk about salt and vinegar as a, pro as a process for finishing. I would not recommend using either of those okay. things. And is salt, that I find like change the colour or? Exactly. Yeah. Vinegar is actually used as another kind of modifier. You know how I call it iron a modifier? Where well, you can also use alkali and acids as, as modifiers. A lot of those are not permanent, um, but using a vinegar rinse as a final bath for washing your naturally dyed things can change your colour dramatically. So even a long time after it's been dyed, that modifier can change the colour, so definitely not. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then Faye is also asking if you've trialled the differences between new moon and full moon. My friend was recently in Guatemala and spent time with natural cotton dyers. They said right. that the full moon harvested plants gave different results to new moon harvested plants. So It's not something that I've explored, but I used to work in organic foods and I definitely, I don't understand how things like biodynamics work, but I definitely see the produce different is different it grows differently yeah. and i i'm sure there's um there's a logic to it yeah. but i just don't i don't know myself yeah i think um i used to live on a community so no mm. we do biodynamic farming and things and there is something to be said for um like if it's a full moon then the water is sitting closer to the surface yeah. um, so if you're planting seeds in particular and you're trying to get things to germinate yep. doing that around the full moon can help wow. because the water is like closer to the surface but it yeah, totally makes sense it's, you know, yeah. there's lots of things that science has not yet explained. But Absolutely. But I, I think organic, like biodynamic food, there's something special about it. So mm -hmm. I, I'm sure there's legitimate. Um, sure. Yeah. People have absolutely loved it and there's yeah. so much positive feedback coming through again. Okay. So yeah. Thank you so much thank for you. Yeah, sharing your like years and years of experience yeah. and experimentation. And no, I it's a total pleasure. Thank you. Thanks so much for sharing. And thank you so much for, for giving me the beautiful fibres to work on. No, so no. amazing. Oh. Yeah, really stunning. Oh. Really stunning work. So. Oh. Um, yeah, everyone's had a brilliant time and I... I think that, you know, if anyone does post any experiments, please do, please do um, like tag Jules and tag us. And you guys, definitely. On um, Instagram yeah. or Facebook, because yeah. I know it would be wonderful to see what you all do with your natural dying adventures. Absolutely. I never, I don't see it enough, you know, so it's great. Please do tag. It's great. Too. Yeah. So inspiring. So thank you. Percent. Mm -hmm. Oh, perfect. Well, thanks so much, Jules. And thank, thank you, you, everyone else. And thanks, everyone, for coming. It was really a, a joy to be here. So thank Absolute you. treat. Thank yeah. you. Bye.